This is the fifth estate winning headlines, your media police post. In this segment, we summarize some of the headlines that you might have missed this morning. But we also take a look at the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country. Today is the 2nd of June 2020 and I am 2J. I am JM. And I am GK and in case you missed the headlines, here they are. In the Daily Nation, why Uhuru wants to change constitution. Mm -hmm. In the Standard, Uhuru, why it can't wait any longer. And mm. in the Star, Uhuru, we must end poll violence. Mm. So I think we're still reeling off the Madaraka Day speech. Yes. Um, and I think all three papers are speaking to his main message yesterday, which mm. was we must change constitution to suit the needs of our country yes. as it grows and develops. So in the Daily Nation, um, he basically, or the article basically outlines how Kenyatta say, was saying that he has discerned a constitutional moment mm -hmm. that yeah. will bring an end to violence experienced in every election. So the idea that every five years there's an election and there's this mm. cyclical violence, violence that happens, yeah. which puts Kenya, um, comes to a grounding halt. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, we must change this. And I think um, he is pitching BBI here. Um, and and without saying it. Without <laughs> saying it. But he's also saying to you, I want to leave you in a better place than when I came in, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think here he may have been... Uh, pitching for consociational democracy. Yeah. And this means power sharing between elites from different social groups. And it works well in deeply divided societies. So mm. we have all these tribes yeah. um, and everybody wants a taste of, you know, power. power. How do we do this in the most sensible way? Yeah. Yes, by abandoning the Ferrari and mm. picking up a pro box. Pro -box a pro box yes. presidency. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think it was interesting. I mean, he did make valid points. You know, we must not be afraid of changing a system that no longer works, works. Mm -hmm. for us. And I think yeah. that's what he was highlighting. Mm. Um, and also that constitutions, hey, are made in times of uh, crisis and if there isn't one, one will be precipitated. So we don't <laughs> want <laughs> a crisis just yet. Um, yeah. So in the standard, we have why it can't wait any longer. Exactly. Again, speaking more to this, how Kenya is ripe for constitutional change. Yeah. Mm. And so he signaled the necessity and the urgency of this moment that we really need to you know, get on it. Um, and it also kind of talked about the deputy president who's been playing this hot and cold game in regards to the constitution. Is he for it? Is he against it? And I think right now we can see that the cards are not in his favor. If mm. everybody is moving towards yeah. this consociational democracy, as you said, GK, mm. the DP has no choice but to get into the pro box or be left behind. Yes. And I think as a country, we can't afford to have this constitutional fatigue. Yeah. I think Scandinavia is the best example of this. They change their constitution so frequently mm. because for them it has to speak to the moment. It has to speak to what society needs. Exactly. Mm. So I think as Kenyans, as Africans, we need to begin to adopt that. Our constitution should not be something that we fear. Yeah. It should be something that we look at and say, if this doesn't work anymore, change it. And Absolutely. interestingly, DP, I think, was it last year in Chatham in London, <laughs> yeah. Ah, yeah. outlined what he thought his uh, constitutional changes um, should be. Mm. But he has seen, since sort of abandoned that conversation. I think <laughs> if he's going to counter BBI, then I think he needs to propose then his ideas something of else, what he yeah. thinks uh, the changes should be, exactly. as opposed to just refusing it for the sake of refusing, refusing. <laughs> um so in the star yes so in, in the star um the president once again uh, just mentioned that we have to have a constitutional change to end the perennial political conflicts mm -hmm. which uh, uh which happen every five years when we go to the polls um and i'll just quote something he said he said uh, very, very, put it marvelously, he, he said, 10 years later, I'm already discerning a constitutional moment. Mm. Not a moment to replace the 2010 constitution, but one to improve it. A mm. moment that will write what we got wrong in 2010. Mm. Very well said. Um, and, and I just want to also say, man is not made for the constitution. The constitution is made for man. Mm. So we shouldn't be afraid to change that, which doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, and really, yesterday's speech by the president, there couldn't be, there couldn't have been a better a better speech for, for such an occasion. Yeah, mm. definitely. Uh, yeah, yeah and I think what I respect way. most is the admission that we did get something wrong in 2010. Yeah. Mm. And there should be nothing wrong with saying that. I think that law is supposed to evolve and change exactly. with the people. And if we didn't get something right, so be it. That's yeah. okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, we have a three-part criteria that we're going to use to break down those three headlines. Mm -hmm. We will ask ourselves, is it topical or speculative? Is it repetitive or groundbreaking? And is it thoughtful or just plain lazy? Toss the star. I think they're all topical. However, <laughs> what, is this poll, what is this poll violence? Poll, 
<laughs> pole violence. It's <laughs> violence which happens at the pole, <laughs> or uh, as a result of you I, know. I think it's a, it's elections. a, ca it's okay. a Kenyanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so ke um, I think I like the Daily Nation. I like the Daily it's Nation. It's as well. direct to the point. It's mm -hmm. telling us, you know, what is supposed to happen. Yeah. Standard yeah. could be ambiguous. What can't wait any longer? Mm, so can that's we true. can we toss the standard and the star and yes. keep the Daily Nation? Fantastic. There you go. Daily Nation gives us our winning headline. Mm -hmm. Onto the political pieces that we call cartoons in this country, where we also have a three-part criteria. We ask ourselves, is it humorous or dry? Is it satirical or pessimistic? And is it effective or just plain lazy? Mm. Shall we begin with the Daily Nation? Yes. And I think all of them are looking at the Wetangula dramas. Yes. So in the Daily Nation, we have a caricature of uh, Wetangula, <laughs> with many arms pointing in very many directions. And he is pointing at Francis Atoli, a caricature of uh, Eugene Omalwa, the CS, and a caricature of Baba Man, Raila. And he is saying, it will be messy and noisy when I decide who <laughs> is to blame. Mm. And this is after his ouster. Mm. Uh, he seems to have lost his position as party leader of Ford K. Mm -hmm. um, and he was replaced by people close to him. Yeah. Uh, Wafula Wamunyini. And I even think one of the deputies was his childhood friend <laughs> mm. who carried out this coup <laughs> against him um, what is loyalty how do you lose your own party <laughs> surely how are you kicked out of your when own party when you're busy the of the party when you're busy tanga tanga that's mm -hmm. what happens tanga -tanga having night great, meetings with uh, the opposition exactly and i think i mean i think clearly he's trying to say he, he needs to blame someone <laughs> but look at what malwa who has his <laughs> behind to him like kiss my <laughs> expletive but <laughs> Let's move mm. to the standard. So in the standard, we have um, a metal arm, um, w which presumably we will say is uh, Baba, Raila's. <laughs> um, and hanging from it is Wetangula, Wetangula mm. uh, Ford Kenya's Chris Wamalwa, and who else? Some other people who mm. presumably lost their positions. A lot of people yeah. lost their positions and committee uh, seats and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and yeah, and Batangula is saying, uh, we are being bullied. Mm. <laughs> but this is politics, so. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. If you can get kicked out of your own party, you probably deserved it. <laughs> it does. Mm. <laughs> uh, so then we have the star. Yes, and in the star you have here, what, what is a NASA slide? So the cartoon portrays caricatures of Raila Odinga uh, and Musale Madabadi on the staircase of the slide. Atwali is at the bottom of the slide and he has pulled back the slide from its uh, uh, horizontal mm. or diagonal position to a vertical position. And hence the thud uh, that Rotangula has experienced after falling from the top. Mm -hmm. And he's pointing a finger, I think, at Atwali, <laughs> saying he is obeying instructions down to the letter. <laughs> and at the bottom of the stair is the letter N at the very uh, beginning. Then the slide is what shows A, and then SA towards the end where Wetangula is positioned. I didn't quite understand this The one. thing is, I really want to like Terrible. this cartoon. No, because I feel like it's saying something, but it's, not, it's, it's not... Yeah, it's, it's a little bit Yeah, it's, it's a little bit complicated. However, I, I think Atoli is emerging in all these cartoons as the man who might just unite the Luya vote, guys. Yes, like, he's really yes. saying, this is the direction we're going. Mm. Um, but yeah, so who do we give it to, guys? I, I like... Daily Nation. Daily Nation? Mm -hmm. Let's mm. give it to the Daily Nation. Yes. Oh, yes, let me talk my cartoons. Hold on. My favorite part. And what is our final thought? And now our final thought. Today it is inspired by a book entitled The Case Against Reality. How Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes, written by Donald Hoffman. Yeah. So as we go about our daily lives, we tend to assume that our perceptions, our five senses, our sight, sound, touch, texture, all of those things are an accurate portrayal of the real world but the author has something different that he wants to explore. Mm. So Hoffman is a professor of cognitive science at the University of California, and he has spent the past three decades studying perception, artificial intelligence, evolutionary game theory, and the brain. And he's come to this dramatic conclusion that the world presented to us by our perceptions is nothing like reality. <laughs> and so he has this idea that people may be perceiving the world as they need it to be mm. rather than what it actually is. Mm. And so the classic argument, this Darwinian argument, is that our ancestors who saw more accurately had a competitive advantage over those who saw less accurately. And thus, 
those ones who saw more accurately were more likely to pass on those genes that were favored to those with more accurate perceptions. Mm. And so we see that evolution shapes our reality, but accuracy, the accuracy of how we receive that, um, those reality is not the priority. And he says that evolution has shaped us with percep perceptions that allow us to survive. And part of that involves hiding from us things that we don't need to know. Mm. And that's pretty much what he says reality has become. And so he uses this metaphor in the book. He says, suppose that you're saving a document on a computer and the icon for its file is blue and it's rectangular and it is in the middle of your screen. Does this actually mean that the file itself is blue, rectangular and in the middle of your screen? Yeah. And he says, no, it, it's not true. Yeah. Because he says the purpose of a desktop interface is to show you the truth of the, sorry, is not to show you the truth of the computer. Mm. Because he says the truth in this metaphor is referring to the circuits, mm. to the codes, to the voltage and to the layers of computer software. Rather, the purpose of this interface is to hide the truth from you, to show you simple graphics so that you can actually operate the computer. Mm. Yeah. And so he says that over time, we have been shaped to have perceptions that keep us alive. Mm. So we have to take them very seriously. So if I see something that looks like a snake, I'm not going to pick it up. If I see a train, I'm not going to jump in front of it. Um, and he says that we've evolved these symbols to keep us alive, so we have to take them seriously. Mm -hmm. But then it would be a logical flaw to think that because we have to take it seriously, it doesn't mm. mean that it's a literal thing. Yeah. So of course, you begin to ask these questions. Are we saying that snakes are not snakes and trains are not trains, cars are not cars? And he's not really saying that because what he focuses on is something called evolutionary game theory. And this is the application of game theory to um, biological sciences, to evolutionary bi biology. And he, look, he looks at contests, at strategies and analytics into which Darwinian competition can be modeled. So he looks at how, you know, that the survival of the fittest in application to the things that we see in nature. Yeah. And so I think it's a really interesting way to look at like computer modeling and how we perceive reality. And you can ask these very bizarre questions like, do we live in a simulation? You know, mm -hmm. is, is the world real? You know, is what we're seeing being filtered through something else? Yeah. And so whether or not you agree with the bizarre things in this book I think it's a really enjoyable read he writes very well mm. and it's also a stimulating exercises that challenges us to consider what we consider reality to be yeah. what could our perceptions be hiding from us yeah. so I would I would encourage it yeah yeah it was very good I, I, so he I'll build up a little bit on what you've uh, talked about to Jay um, and what he explores uh, in parts of the book is how our visual senses are wired and he breaks down for us how the eye works and how it communicates with the brain and I'll get to that in a bit and uh, he makes a submission as you've mentioned to Jay that evolution by natural selection does not favor true perceptions instead natural selection favors perceptions that hide the truth and guide us towards useful action <laughs> and what I understand by that uh, is that when our eyes set upon something they do not record objective reality mm. uh, they convey to the brain only that which we deem important in that moment mm. yeah. and he gives an example of a shopper in a supermarket uh, confronted by tens or even hundreds of similar products. The shopper's eye has been trained for fitness. Uh, it's been trained to see a particular thing. Uh, and so your eye has been trained, uh, um, you, you know, to look out for visual uh, clues uh, uh, and, and, and cues that signal that it may be worth the effort to inquire a little bit further mm. into that product or yeah. into that poster and that kind of thing. Um, and so he says, here's how our, our, our eyes work. He breaks it down and he says, um, in, in, you know, in, in even one second, they absorb countless uh, uh, bits of information. Mm. And all those bits of information are like spam, uh, which hits your <laughs> inbox. Mm. And so it deletes a lot of them mm. very, uh, almost, almost instantaneously, yeah. immediately. Um, and, and so the photoreceptors, which are the sensory cells which respond to light uh, falling into our eyes, those are the ones which receive the, the, all the tons of information. He says around 130 million uh, tons of information wow. that we're absorbing every second. Mm. And so those then uh, uh, get in and they're reduced to only 40. <laughs> so from 130 million, only uh, 40 
uh, make it to the uh, conscious mind mm. uh, that you are now able to process and to focus on. Mm. And so he says, if we didn't have that process, our mind, uh, our eyes also would be overwhelmed. Yeah. Cluttered, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So let me build on that. In chapter two, he talks about beauty, um, calling them the sirens of the gene. Um, and he makes a quote by David Hume, which says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We mm. all know this. Yes. Um, and he says, beauty is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them. Mm. And each mind perceives a different beauty. That's mm. why I might find 2J very beautiful, somebody else may not. Mm. Um, but the idea here is that we're looking at reproductive success. We're looking at how many fitness points, and by fitness here we mean how, 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 um, how, how, how well is an organism adapted to its environment? So when I look at Tuji and I say, okay, how reproductively successful will she be? And mm. your eye does this, which is what uh, you, you've just explained, JM. And so what happens is um, he looks at why, uh, through evolution, um, how when you glance at a person, you immediately and unconsciously pick up dozens of those sensory clues. Mm. Um, and you run them through this sophisticated algorithm um, and you decide if somebody is reproductively uh, has that potential for mm. you. And this usually means, can they raise my offspring? How, mu how, how many offspring do I want? Mm. All that stuff, right? And it's as usual, it's as simple as, is he hot or is he not? <laughs> <laughs> as simple as that. Um, but he delves into the human eye um, quite a bit. And he says um, there's, uh, th there's clues in the human eye uh, which men and women are, dif are attracted to differently. So mm. he says men are attracted to women with larger eyes and have larger irises. <laughs> um, and they have a slightly bluish sclera. So sclera is the whites of the eye. Mm. So if they're slightly blue, that makes uh, a man attracted to you. Mm. And also what he highlights is this thing called a distinct uh, limbal ring. The, the, um, the dark the border between your iris mm -hmm. and the sclera. Mm. And so there's a famous picture, which will um, pop up on your screen, of the Afghan girl. It was in the National Geographic. And she had, it became the most recognized photo, I think, in the world. Mm. Um, and she had very prominent rings um, around her eyes. Yeah. Mm. And for him, he says in evolution, it signals health, youth, and that's what men are attracted mm. to. That's why they pick it. So men also prefer these larger irises only in women under 50. Yeah. You may pick up the book to figure okay. out why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so a woman who knows this and you want to make yourself more attractive, people buy contact lenses, mm. they try to accentuate their eyes, they try to put themselves so that those cues are picked up by yeah. their male counterparts. Um, interestingly, for women, uh, across all cultures, prefer tall and slightly older men. Uh, so for a man, his age and height correlate with his status and his resources. Mm. So women can tell, you know, um, if this man is going to be able to take care of me, is he going to be able to handle my needs, right? Mm. But also interesting, he says, a woman can tell if a man is prone to cheat and divert resources to other women. Mm. Apparently, cheaters tend to look more masculine, but not more attractive. <laughs> so there's your tidbit for the week. <laughs> so, and then he gives another example of an evolutionary trap. And mm. the reason why those are traps is because um, a woman can have larger irises, but not be able to be uh, reproductively, you know, uh, mm. functional for you or even have those um, things that you wish to, to get, right? Um, such as children or whatever. So he gives one in the animal kingdom. He takes us back to Australia in the 1980s mm -hmm. and he talks about male jewel, jewel beetles. So they look like, in Kenya, we used to have the Tusker export bottle. Mm -hmm. And in, in Australia, this beer bottle was called a stubby. They're called stubbies. So stubbies would be littered around the desert and these jewel beetles, the male ones, would come and try to mate with the stubbies. <laughs> and that's because um, for them, the cues they picked up is that this bottle is shiny, it's uh, the same it's color, the same color. Mm. It's got dimples, just like a female jewel beetle. And so they would try to um, mate with these bottles. Yeah. Mm. And in the act of mating, they would have their genitalia out and there would be predatory <laughs> ants next to them, which would start to eat out the male jewel beetle. So they started to go extinct. Mm -hmm. um, so Australia had to change the bottle shape from the stubby to wow. make it a different shape, just so that these jewel beetles don't go mm. yeah. extinct. extinct. And so this is what he, biologists would call the evolutionary trap. Mm. And so it's what happens when you're wired to respond to certain cues in nature, such as being brown, having dimples, mm. uh, but then instead you bump into a human invention and you 
get confused yeah. and you yeah. end up <laughs> mating with a bottle instead of a female. What a story. Uh, but it was really, really interesting. But it's just the idea of that perception is warped. Mm. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. Those cues really change from time yeah, to time. Yeah, exactly. So on a day where we had a winning headline from the Daily Nation mm -hmm. and a winning cartoon from the Daily Nation, I want to leave you with this. And it's a quote from none other than Ivanka Trump. Oh, wow. And she says... <laughs> Perception is more important than reality. If someone perceives something to be true, it is more important if it is in fact true. It's more important that uh, the perception becomes mm. more important than, mm. than, 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 than the, the, actual, actual the actual truth. So there you go. So watch out <laughs> as you go into the world. What is, what is real and what is just uh, a perception. bottle? Yeah, what is a bottle? <laughs> Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, but also find us on TV. We're on GoTV, Pancreater, and Star Times. Have a lovely evening.